Today, we're going to talk about um, a word that always surfaces in religious conversations, um, a word that certainly is going to surface eventually if you're trying to start all over, and it's certainly a word that you know something about because it's a word you grew up hearing about, especially if you grew up in a Christian church. And the word is this word right here, sin. Now, this is such an interesting word because in our culture, it is almost a purely theological term, isn't it? You don't really use this term unless you're talking about something that deals with God, okay? We don't use it in everyday life. You don't tell your children, honey, you sinned against your mother. I mean, you, you'd like to say that, but we just don't use it within that context. The only time we use the word sin is in relationship to God. Um, this isn't a, a term you use in business. You don't say, hey, you need to come to my office. We need to talk about some of your sins. That would just be weird, wouldn't it, right? When the police pull, pull you over, you don't get a sin citation. You know, we give you a little sin citation, okay? So this is a word, this is a word that is almost purely theological. The other thing about this word, and the reason we resist it, and the reason we have to wrestle with it a little bit, because regardless of what religion you're considering, or what you're coming out of or moving toward, this word or some form of it's gonna pop up. The other reason um, that this is important for us is because it's such a heavy word. And I think part of the reason we resist it is if if you were to acknowledge or, or say, I've sinned, that's kind of like a big exclamation mark at the end and you're done. It's like saying, I'm toast, it's over, there's no hope, I've sinned. Because sin, the idea of sin, doesn't leave us with any wiggle room, right? There's no wiggle room, there's no blame. You can't say, but you see my grandfather and then my father and then me and then the reason is and the, my inner child and you know, you can do all that, you know, but when it comes to sin, Sin is like looking in the mirror and go, going, there's the problem. I've sinned. So what we've done in our culture, and for many, 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 many years, is we've removed that, room, that word, and we've substituted it with a word that's a lot easier for us to bear. And it is a terrible word. It doesn't even come close to the gravity and the weight of sin. And I understand why we did this, because sin feels so condemning. Sin feels, kind of leaves me on the outs with God and with nowhere to go. I've sinned the end, you know? So what we've done, and you've heard this a thousand times in culture. In fact, you've done this yourself. We have replaced the word sin with the word mistake. This is terrible, okay? And we're gonna see this in just a few minutes. I understand why we do this. And so we see people, in fact, we, how many times have you seen some politician or some public official or somebody go on television in front of eight microphones and confess a mistake? And you, and, you know, and you listen to the story, you know, they blew up their family and they blew up their office and they blew up their reputation and they hurt the city and they keep talking about, I've made some mistakes and I've made a mistake. And you're sitting there as an adult going, okay, wait, 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 wait. That's not a mistake. I don't know what it is, but it's way bigger than a mistake. A mistake is something you make on a math test, okay? This was far bigger than that. A mistake is something you make when you're filling out your income re tax return. That's, mistake is, you know, you're trying to drive and look at directions at the wrong time, and you make a left when you should make a right. That's a mistake. Buddy, what you did, or honey, what you did, that wasn't a mistake. That was way bigger than a mistake, but we use the term mistake, and we kind of dumb it all down. Now, before you get all high and mighty, I just want you to think about this for just a minute. If I were to come in here and with no context, just walk in here and start cold, and if I were to say, and don't, don't raise your hands, okay? If you're watching online or on television by yourself, you can raise your hand, but everybody else, just no hands, no elbows, okay? If I were to say, how many of you, how many of you have some mistakes in your past? When you look back, you, you, you've made some mistakes in your past, you know? Everybody would put their hand up. In fact, you would not put your hand up for you know, fear that somebody would look at you and go, you know, sort of like you're perfect. I mean, every, everybody's made mistakes, right? Isn't it true? Everybody's made mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But if I were to come in here without any context and you just come walk right in and say, how many of you have sin in your past? Okay, let me just tell you about the front row with that question. The front row is like, Because I don't know, is anybody raising their hand behind us? Is this, I mean, mistake, okay, yeah, I mean, who hasn't made it? Sin, it's like, whoa, but, but what's up with that? It's just, there, there's something just so heavy. But, so we've replaced it with the word mistake, and I think we need a different word, and, and I think we all know we need a different word. See, the, mis the idea of a mistake is insufficient knowledge. That's the whole idea of a mistake. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know this is where that led. I didn't know, I'm dumb, I plead ignorance, I made a mistake, but come on. 
You've used the term mistake to talk about things that the, it wasn't a problem with insufficient knowledge. You knew exactly what you were doing. Now I need to kind of twist this knife a little bit because this is a really, really important thing for us to wrestle with. The truth is, come on, sometimes, isn't this true? Sometimes we make mistakes on purpose. <laughs> now just think about that. Isn't it true some of the things that you've called a mistake, you did them on purpose? I mean, when somebody gets on television and you know, confesses to some four-year-long mistake, <laughs> can you make the same mistake for four years and then at the end of four years when you're caught go, well, it was a mistake. Well, yeah, it was a mistake, but it was bigger than a mistake, right? And then sometimes, just to be worried, sometimes we plan our mistakes. What do you call a mistake that you planned? I mean, some of you bought airline tickets in order to facilitate a mistake. It wasn't like a spur of the moment I fell to temptation. You planned this out, right? Some of you have a stash of mistakes hidden at your house, right? Some of you have already planned your next mistake. What do you call that? Don't you think the word mistake falls way short of the gravity of the kinds of things that we're talking about? I mean, I mean really, a premeditated mistake? Can there be such a thing? And then what about this? Sometimes, in fact, the truth is almost all the time, we make the same mistake over and over. Now come on, work with me. What, what do you call a mistake that you make over and over, or, or, or worse? What do you call a person who makes the same mistake over and over and over and over and over? See, mistake just doesn't cut it, does it? There's something else going on. It's worse than a mistake. You know why? What do you do? What do you do with a mistake? Tell me. It starts with a C. You correct. Thank you. I heard that. You correct a mistake. I mean, that's easy. Make a mistake, correct the mistake. Hey, I'm going to go back two streets to take a right. Hey, I'm going to erase that and do it again. Hey, thanks for the help. I'll, I'll fix that. I won't make that mistake next time. You correct a mistake. The problem is this. You can't correct you. And you're the problem. And I'm the problem. It's not that we make mistakes because you can correct a mistake. The problem is me. The problem is you. And come on, you have had a really hard time correcting you, right? So what do you call that? What is that? And whatever your religious persuasion, wherever you are in terms of your faith, and if you're trying to start up your faith again, and you're gonna, I wanna hit the restart button, one of the things that you've gotta figure out, one of the questions you have to answer is, why am I not able to do what I know I should do? And why am I unwilling or why do I resist the idea of embracing the fact that it might be a sin problem? You've tried to fix you, your, your wife has tried to fix, correct you, you know, and your husband's tried to correct you, and you've tried to correct your kids, and they keep doing the same things over and over. Some of you pay somebody $120 an hour to sit with you to try to correct you, and it's like you just can't be corrected. Some of you blown up a marriage because you were uncorrectable. Some of you blown up a job because you were uncorrectable. Some of you have a whole lot of debt you shouldn't have, and you knew that when you were making the decisions that these were bad decisions, and you did it anyway. What is wrong with you, people, you know? And then here's one. This is the strangest one of all, perhaps. You know those weeks when you're doing really well? I mean, whatever your deal is, you know, you think, I'm quit drinking so much, or, I'm quit doing this so much, or, I'm not going to spend time with them, or I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to look at that. I mean, whatever your thing is that you know is not good for you, not good for your family, not good for your finance. And so, you know, seven days in a row, you've been whatever free. You know, I haven't been to the mall in a week. Awesome. You know, I haven't used a credit card. You know, what, I don't know what your deal is, right? That thing that you know you just shouldn't do. And you're doing good. I mean, you're nine days in. I've been, I haven't drank for nine days. You know, I haven't used that language for nine days. I haven't gone to those websites for 10 days, okay? And you're doing good. You're correcting. You are self-correcting. Now, here's the weird thing. Isn't it weird that even when you're correcting, there's part of you that wants to go uncorrect? And you keep thinking about it. And you think, and then you, you do stuff like this. Well, you know what? I haven't done that in 13 days. I owe myself one. <laughs> what? Now, come on, come on. What is that? I mean, why would you do something that hurts you, know it hurts you, and then do it again? Why do you do that? I mean, this is the same question your parents asked you when, you're, when you were growing up. My point is this. I don't think you can chalk all of that insanity to, up to, well, nobody's perfect. I made a mistake. So, a baby step, a baby step 
is to at least to embrace the notion that perhaps you have a deeper problem. Perhaps you are a sinner. Perhaps sin is a reality, even though we want to dumb it down to mistake. In fact, here's kind of the, the 101 definition of a, of a sinner. This isn't theological. This is just a, hey, maybe I can go that far. A sinner is basically somebody who knows better, but does it anyway. Somebody who knows better, but does it anyway. Now, here's the interesting thing. Jesus, this is not a shot, Jesus talked about sin. But when Jesus talked about sin, and you need to know this. Now, I'm not arguing that you should believe in Jesus. I'm not arguing that Jesus is the Son of God. This is just information. This is just if you said, hey, what did Jesus say about sin? Here's what Jesus taught consistently about sin. That when Jesus talked about sin, he talked about sin in connection to relationship. And Jesus said what all of us have experienced. That sin breaks relationships. Sin breaks breaks relationships. If you've ever broken a relationship, it's because you did something that you shouldn't have done or somebody else did something they shouldn't have done or both of you did things you shouldn't do. And what happened? It broke the relationship. So because of that, Jesus' entire purpose, Jesus' entire purpose of talking about sin was restoration, not condemnation. We think sin, we think condemnation. Jesus says, I want to talk about sin. I oh, don't talk about sin. I feel so bad about myself. Jesus says, well, we've got to talk about sin because I can't get you restored until you're willing to accept the fact that you're not just a mistaker. You are, in fact, a sinner. Now, here's, here's what Jesus knew. This is so important. Jesus knew that as long as you just think you're making mistakes, you will never seek the thing you need most to bring restoration. Because if sin breaks relationships, what restores relationships? Here's, here's how we approach it. You, you've had this in your marriage or with your kids a thousand times. You know, your husband does something that really just, I mean, he was just dead wrong. And you confront him and he says, sorry. How restored is the relationship around, okay, sorry. Is everybody like, oh, things are good. Now, what, what's, come on, think with me. What's wrong with that? Or you confront one of your kids and they're busted and they know you've caught them and they, you told them not to, they did it anyway, and they go, Mom, okay, okay, sorry. And they feel like, okay, I've done all I need to do. What's wrong with that? Why, why isn't that enough? Why is it, okay, let's go on family vacation, have a good time. What's wrong with that? Now, here's what's wrong with it. Because they've acknowledged, okay, I made a mistake. So since I made a mistake, sorry for the mistake. Can we just go on? And something in you knows, no, we can't go on because sorry doesn't restore the relationship, does it? Now, this is important. As long as you think you are a mistaker, you will never seek forgiveness because mistakes don't require forgiveness. Because the mistake was, oh, bad judgment. Mistake was, I didn't know any better. Mistake was, oh, I'll try to do better next time. Mistake was, I just didn't have all the information. You do not have to forgive someone for making a mistake. That's why somebody says, okay, sorry. And they think, hey, are we back? And you're like, no, you considered a mistake, but it damaged our relationship. Sorry, that's because you just think it wasn't a big deal. You think it was, you know, nobody's perfect, so what? But you've damaged the relationship. I want the relationship restored, and the only way for the relationship to be restored, are you ready for this? The only way for the relationship to be restored, you know this in marriage with your boyfriend, girlfriend, and your kids, the only way for the relationship to be restored is for the offender to acknowledge and embrace the fact that there was an offense. And they don't just say, sorry, and they don't do the, the next best thing, which is, I'm sorry. Did I hear an I'm? No, it's bare I. You know, it's not like an I'm sorry. It's a, I'm sorry. <laughs> Could we have a little more I'm in the sorry? But that starts to get a little personal, so it's, I'm sorry. But see, if, if, you're gonna, if it's going to be restored, something else has to happen. Somebody has to look at you in the eye and say, I'm sorry. Because I was wrong. And it wasn't a mistake. I did it on purpose. And I'm sorry. Oh. Now, here's Jesus' point. This is so brilliant. This is why I read the New Testament and go, nobody could have made this up. This doesn't fit the current religious system. This didn't fit, you know, the pagan religion. This didn't fit anything. This was so new. Jesus comes along and says, your heavenly father wants you to be restored to him. <laughs> and the only way to be restored is to seek forgiveness. And the only way and the only reason you'll seek forgiveness is if you realize you didn't simply made a make a mistake. 
It's bigger than that. And the only way that you're going to be restored is to seek forgiveness. And you're not going to seek forgiveness until you acknowledge the fact that you have in fact sinned. And that perhaps it's worse than that because it's not the first time. You are a sinner. And Jesus says, but don't freak out because that's not the end. That's a means to a very important end. So Jesus comes along. It's so amazing. So he, here's what he did. It's so fascinating. He would teach on sin and here's what he would do. Instead of dumbing it down like, oh, that's okay. You're only 15. You didn't know better. And that's okay. You know, I'm God and you're not. So how would you know? He didn't do that, you know, or well, have, you know, you probably haven't read the whole, you probably weren't raised in a Jewish home or a Christian home or you know, he didn't do any of that. Jesus came along. He said, hey, you think you've done a few things bad? You have no idea how bad you are. Let me tell you how bad you are. And he jacked the standard up so high, everybody went, we're doomed. And once they acknowledged that they were doomed, Jesus said, I have some great news. I'm here for the doomed people. In fact, I'm only here for the doomed people. I'm not here for you unless you're doomed. Anybody here doomed? I tried. But to be doomed, I have to acknowledge. And Jesus said, that, that's the point. God loves doomed people, but people who won't experience the, the love of God until they acknowledge they're doomed. So I'm here to make you all feel really doomed and condemned. And then just before you all go out and, you know, you know jump off a cliff, I'm going to come rushing in saying, guess what? God loves doomed sinners. That's why he sent me. But you'll never know me until you acknowledge something about you. 